Tonight's topic is our allies in the Middle East, the future of Kurdistan. And our speaker is Dr. Jesse Clark, a geographer and professor at University of Nevada, Reno. Recent events in the Middle East have shown just how complicated the Kurdish question has become for the United States. Are we considering them as our allies in the fight against ISIS? Or do we think they might be posing some threat to the Turkish sovereignty? It's important to understand the regional geopolitics and internal dynamics of the Kurdish peoples as we discuss the future of Kurdistan. Dr. Clark has conducted field research in southeast Turkey over the last decade, working closely with Kurdish populations. Tonight, Dr. Clark will reflect on her experiences and offer insight into this important yet complex region of the world. So as you are very familiar, after Dr. Clark's presentation, we will have time for your comments and questions. So now please join me in welcoming Dr. Clark to the podium. Thank you. Thank you so much um, for welcoming me to my, on my first visit to Michigan. I've never been to Michigan before, so um, Grand Rapids has been a great welcome. Um, here. And I want to start off with a couple of thank yous. So I want to thank the board of directors and the staff at the World Affairs Council, um, in particular, Dixie Anderson, the director, and Ashley Kasuba. Um, I want to also thank Aquinas College for hosting this event. I want to thank Hope College for hosting me tomorrow. Um, I would like to thank Mark and Graham and Class and Charles, who have facilitated all of my media needs and technology and audio needs today. Um, and I also, I especially want to thank Dr. Erica Kubrick, who's working with the World Affairs Council, who um, was the first person to contact me and has facilitated my trip here and has been working tirelessly to make sure that my stay has been wonderful, and it has been wonderful. So thank you very much to her. And then, of course, last but not least, to Dr. Mike DeVivo, who was, um, who kind of facilitated the contact here between me and the World Affairs Council from the beginning, a fellow geographer. And we've had a lot of fun um, yesterday and today talking about all things geography. And he took me on a great tour of Grand Rapids. So I had a little urban geography tour. So I really appreciated that. So thank you, Mike. OK. So I was asked to come talk to you all today about our allies in the Middle East, in part because my expertise is in Turkey. So I'll begin with a question. How many of you think Turkey is an ally to the United, to the United States? How many of you would consider Turkey an ally to the United States? OK? All right. How many of you consider the Kurds an ally to the to the United States in the Middle East. OK. <laughs> Can it be both? In 2016, in Turkey, it's not looking like that. It turns out the long 100-year history of the Kurds in this region makes that question very hard to answer. The Kurds are our allies in the fight against ISIS. They were our allies in the First and Second Gulf Wars. They are historically important allies to the United States. Turkey is also an ally. Turkey is a fellow member of NATO, an EU candidate, and has been called the best example of a moderate Muslim state in the region and a stabilizing force. The problem is that Turkey is currently at war with a segment of its Kurdish population in cities across southeast Turkey, and it has recently started a military campaign against Syrian Kurds to the south who, along with their Turkish and Iraqi counterparts, are the United States boots on the ground fighting ISIS. Today, I'm going to talk to you about the conflict unfolding in Turkey. Why? Because I've spent over 10 years working in the southeast Turkish region, the Kurdish region of Turkey, and because this conflict is personal to me. But 
it's also personal to you. The ramifications of this conflict have consequences for the United States' fight against ISIS, as well as our simultaneous but conflicting allied relationships with Turkey and the Kurds. So, as any good geographer, I'm going to start off with a map to help us set the scene. And this is a map of the Kurdish regions published in the Wall Street Journal over the summer. The salmon color area here depicts Kurdish inhabited regions. There are approximately 28 million Kurds in the region. The largest population is housed in Turkey, with 12 to 15 million Kurds, or approximately 20% of the population. There are 6 million Kurds in Iran, 5 to 6 million Kurds in Iraq, and approximately 2 million Kurds in Syria. Kurds have lived in this region since the early second millennium BCE. It's a mountainous region. The Kurds pivot around the Zagros mountain range. So the mountain range kind of extends here, uh, where the Turkish, Syrian, and Iraqi borders meet, and kind of follows um, the border, Iraqi and um, Turkish border here, and then down um, there at the intersection of the Iraqi and Iranian border. For this reason, the mountains have always been very symbolic for the Kurds. So you'll hear things like, Kurds have no friends but the mountains. They are self a self-defined ethnic group with language as a defining feature, and approximately two-thirds to three-quarters of Kurds are Sunni Muslims. These pink areas, this pink area here, also indicate, indicates roughly what was once going to be a sovereign and independent Kurdish state, Kurdistan. You'll notice that there is no border around this region today. The closest thing we see to a bordered Kurdistan is this autonomous zone in northern Iraq, Iraqi Kurdistan. When the Middle East was partitioned at the end of World War I through a series of treaties between allied and regional leaders, a proposed Kurdish state was very much on the table in the 1920 Treaty of Sevres. And then it wasn't annulled and replaced by the Treaty of Lausanne in 1923 that secured the borders as they are today and as they are depicted in this map. That was, that was Kurdistan. Today, it's not. As a result, Kurds have different political histories and experiences depending on where they are located. They are citizens of four different countries, Iraq, Iran, Syria, and Turkey. And while I say citizens to denote state belonging, in all of these cases, Kurds have been treated as second-rate citizens throughout the 20th and 21st centuries. In some cases, as in Syria, not even as citizens. In addition to shared language and geography, there is a common experience of political oppression across borders that unites Kurds today, and the, this common Kurdish experience. The region that we'll be talking about today is northern Syria and southeastern Turkey. Um, but I'll have plenty of time at the end to answer questions about some of the other parts of this region, and they will come into play. I want to focus on this region because there are very important events unfolding here that matter to the US in its fight against ISIS, its future relationship with both its Turkish and Kurdish allies, prospects for long-term stability in the Middle East, and of course, the future of Kurdistan. Currently, in cities across the southeast region, if we zoom in on Turkey, Turkey is engaged in war with the PKK, an armed nationalist group that has been fighting for rights and recognition in Turkey since the early 1980s. And it's a, an armed group that's considered to be a terrorist group by the Turkish government as well as the United States government. So they've been fighting the PKK, um, the Turkey is engaged in war with the PKK in this region currently, this in spite of the fact that up until July 2015, Turkey and the PKK were in the middle of a two and a half year long peace process. And there was a real sense of hope among both Turks and Kurds about the future of Turkish-Kurdish relations. In fact, the map I just showed you was published in the Wall Street Journal in June 2015 with this accompanying photo and an article that spoke quite optimistically about the state of the Kurds, that double entendre referring to both status and prospects for independence. Indeed, there have been some hopeful developments in the Kurdish regions towards increased independence. 
Iraqi Kurdistan holds significant autonomy since the Gulf end of the first Gulf War. Out of the power vacuum created by the Syrian civil war, Syrian Kurds have established self-government in parts of northern Syria. And a pro-Kurdish party in Turkey has made significant gains for Kurdish representation, most recently in the last Turkish general election at the time the story was written. And so this is actually an image from HDP, the pro-Kurdish political party in Turkey. Um, this is an image of supporters of that party celebrating the gains after the general election in June. In Turkey, when the current ruling party, the AKP, the Justice and Development Party, came into power in 2002, they extended a number of reconciliatory efforts towards the Kurds in the form of political, social, and economic initiatives. The pro-Kurdish government also spearheaded a number of development efforts at the city level and sometimes in coordination with the Turkish national government. And the PKK and AKP began a peace process in 2012. So things were looking pretty optimistic. Unfortunately, that window for peace was slammed shut this summer. Since July, the southeast Turkish region has devolved into conflict once again, as the PKK has taken up arms against the Turkish state with an affiliated youth movement declaring certain urban neighborhoods in the Kurdish regions autonomous. So what happened in such a short amount of time? I want to shed light on the reasons Turkey is fighting its Kurds internally, and to do so, I'd like to complicate our ideas of the Kurds. Do we know who we're talking about? And what's actually gone on in this region beyond the major headlines? So let's zoom in to the southeast Turkish region. Since Turkish independence, this is where Kurds reside primarily in um, southeast Turkey. Since Turkish independence in 1923, the Kurds have had limited to no minority rights as their identity was subsumed at least officially into a Turkish one. So when describing the first decade of reforms in which a series of restrictions on Kurdish expression were implemented, my research collaborator, who's a Kurd, said to me, Jesse, can you imagine one day a whole population woke up and no longer existed? And for many Kurds in Turkey at the time, this was a reality. Through a process of Turkification, Kurdish expression of any kind, language, dress, naming rights, was made illegal, and that happened very, very quickly. So what do you do when someone tells you you don't exist? You probably fight. And indeed, there have been over 36 identifiable Kurdish rebellions throughout the 20th century in Turkey. When I first went to Turkey in 2003, this region was fresh out of a bitter and violent 15-year period of sustained fighting between the PKK, led by its founder, Abdullah Öcalan, who's now in prison, and Turkish security forces, in which approximately 40,000 people were killed, thousands of villages burned, and millions of people displaced. And the numbers range anywhere from one to four million, depending on the source. At that time, and still today, much of the urban southeast looks like this. Combination of established housing and infrastructure, alongside squatter settlements, or gejikandu as they're called in, in Turkish, built to accommodate the thousands of families fleeing rural violence. After a ceasefire between the PKK and Turkish state in 1999, and the election into office of the AKP, led by Recep Tayyip Erdogan in 2002, Turkish policy in the region shifted. The government initiated, or resurrected in some cases, a number of economic and social development initiatives. For example, some of you may have heard of the Southeast Anatolian Project, the GAP Project, a hydroelectric venture began in the 1970s, but expanded in the 2000s that outlined the construction of a series of dams on the Tigris and Euphrates as means to harness water to irrigate, mechanize, and essentially modernize agriculture in order to boost the local ec economy. In addition, there were social programs implemented, um, particularly in urban areas, such as women's education and empowerment centers, primarily located in poor and migrant neighborhoods, so some of the neighborhoods I just showed you. Um, and actually, it was in these centers that I did a lot of my research, which focused um, on the role of women in development. 
a pro-Kurdish political party established in the 1990s with a clear platform to spearhead the advancement of Kurdish rights, was elected into city governments in Southeast Turkey in 1999, and has also brought forward similar development initiatives in the urban er areas. So on the left here, this is actually um, a women's education center or a support center sponsored by the um, municipal or the city pro-Kurdish government. And on the right here is a center sponsored by the national Turkish government. There was a lot to be hopeful for when the AKP came into power and the pro-Kurdish government took more control over local offices, government offices in Southeast Turkey. Then, this past summer in June, Turkey held general elections. For the first time in history, the pro-Kurdish government, HDP, the People's Democratic Party, gained enough votes to pass the minimum threshold of 10% for representation in parliament. It was special for the fact that this was a first for the party, but it was monumental for the fact that it was the first time in Turkish history the Kurds would have an identifiable and official voice in government. And I was actually in Southeast Turkey when this happened in June, um, and I just remember, you know, when the ro votes rolled in and the television stations or the news stations were um, declaring the final tallies, um, and I think the HDP, the pro-Kurdish government, got about 13% of the vote. Um, there was just this sheer joy across the city. I was in Diyarbakir, and there were just parties on the street till all hours of the morning. And it was a pretty amazing time to be there, especially having worked in this region for so long. It was a really important and special time for a lot of Kurds. Um, and this was actually a picture taken at a pro-Kurdish political rally that had happened two days before the general elections. So there was a real sense of hope and optimism. The window for peace and recognition was flung open in a very dramatic fashion. But it was very soon after this moment that the window came crashing down. So while the HDP gained votes in that election, the AKP, the leading government, um, lost votes and also did not earn enough to remain in single party rule. This meant a coalition government was in order. Unfortunately, there was a failure to form a coalition government by August, and the AKP called for new elections in November. A number of political analysts have suggested that the AKP intentionally stalled the coalition building process in order to procure a new election and thereby a shot at regaining those lost votes. In, the no in November, the second time around, the pro-Kurdish party lost votes, but not enough to move below the threshold the AKP gained votes, enough to continue under single party rule. As coalition debates and deliberations continued between June and August, when that runoff election was called, the peace process ended in July in that interim period. And Turkey's deep-seated fears of Kurdish separatism and terrorism returned to the table. What happened? I can tell you what happened in Diyarbakir, and we'll let that city and story stand in for similar processes and experiences across the urban southeast. It's in Diyarbakir that I've conducted a good chunk of my research, so I know this, pretty, this city pretty well. Diyarbakir is also an important site on its own. It's a very symbolic city for Kurds, so it's um, termed fondly by many Kurds the unofficial capital of Kurdistan. It was on the receiving end of hundreds of thousands of displaced families during the 1990s, probably the most of any city in this region. So in 1994, for example, the population grew from around 300,000 to 800,000 people. So quite quickly, the population grew with this influx of, of um, displaced families from the rural areas. Focal, it's been a focal point of anxieties between the Kurds and Turkish state. For example, it's the seat of the pro-Kurdish party, while at the same time being the home of one of the largest Turkish military bases in the region. People often look to Diyarbakir to measure the state of relations between Turks and Kurds. So in spite of this recent growth of a political voice for the Kurds in Turkey, efforts towards inclusion and social and economic development in the Southeast region Kurds have still experienced a great deal of disenfranchisement. 
It can often feel, if you live in this city or others in that region, it can often feel as if you take two steps forward, one step back, or one step forward, three steps back at any given time. Kind of like, you know, this awkward dance where you feel as if you're making headway in repairing political relations, gaining ground, um, acquiring rights, and then suddenly it's taken away. So there's this pervasive sense of distrust of the Turkish government in this region. So for example, this is an image from 2009 that I took in December in Diyarbakir. Um, and in it, at, that, at that time in December, the, um, the um, police, the Turkish police, rounded up over 100 pro-Kurdish party members with, and accused them of having ties to, the, to, to, ter to terrorism, so having ties to the PKK. And there was this really poignant image in the newspapers when this happened of all of these pro-Kurdish party members lined up outside of the courthouse in Diyarbakir with their, um, their hands handcuffed in plas plastic handcuffs. And in the weeks to follow, these billboards appeared in the city that said, um, so kalepce is a Turkish word for handcuff, that said, not handcuffs, equality. Not handcuffs, freedom not handcuffs, justice. Another billboard read, and I don't have a picture of that, but Dun Halepce, Bugun Kalepce. Yesterday, Halabja, today, handcuffs. Referring to the city of Halabja, Iraq, that the Ba'athist regime of Saddam Hussein gassed in 1988, killing 5,000 people. So this example shows you how different Kurdish movements across the region have tapped into each other quite symbolically. Things like this mass Incarceration of public officials can feel commonplace in these cities, in spite of some of the more positive developments we've seen. As well, I mentioned that the last decade and a half was a time of great investment and development initiatives as a mechanism for security building and social and economic integration. Um, but much of that development in the cities has looked like this. So over the last decade, like cities across Turkey, Diyarbakir has been on the receiving end of billions in federal money towards urban development projects um, as a way to boost the economy through the growth of the construction industry. Um, so if you, go, if you go to Istanbul today, it looks like a very different city, and um, you'll most likely see on the horizon just a series of cranes constructing new projects. The AKP claims to have invested $5.4 billion in construction, infrastructure, housing, education, and health programs in Diyarbakir alone. The problem is that very little of this money flows directly to low-income and migrant residents. Unemployment has remained quite high in the Kurdish Southeast at 24.2%, in contrast to 3.5% in the Northeast. In Diyarbakir, it hovers around 20%, and a large proportion is youth, is poor youth. In addition, the influx of refugees from Syria and Iraq has added cheap and undocumented labor for farming and industrial operations, making competitive an already weak and saturated job market. If you look at the urban structure of Diyarbakir today, you very easily see a story of economic disparity. Expanding luxury apartment complexes and shopping malls to the north alongside progressively marginalized migrant neighborhoods. Um, and so here are some of the images from two new shopping malls in Diyarbakir, um, some of the high-end luxury apartments and, and condos and homes up north, and then Diyarbakir's first Starbucks appeared, I think came two years ago. Here's an image from one of the poor migrant neighborhoods I've, I've previously mentioned to you where we have seen some investment, some recent government investment in the form of urban renewal and rehousing projects, like this one, co-sponsored by both the national and the local governments. And these projects have resulted um, in the forcible displacement of residents, and these projects began in 2009. So propelled by earthquake concerns and failing infrastructure, these projects are not without some justification, yet a financial investment in the built environment has unfolded side by side a disinvestment in the people who reside there. Even where the government has not been tearing down buildings, there have been only minor efforts to keep them up. 
I showed you an image earlier depicting some of those squatter settlements that were created during the 1990s conflict in a process of over-urbanization. Over Here are some more images, neighborhoods where hundreds of thousands of internally displaced people sought refuge in the 1990s, spaces that in spite of some investment are plagued by inadequate housing, lack of access to services, and to chronic poverty. What have these urban development projects meant for poor Kurds in these disaffected urban spaces? How have they been lived? So I'm going to let their words um, tell you the story. So I'm about to show you a series of quotes from some interviews that my research partner and I conducted in 2010, 2012, and 2014 with individuals working in some of the poor migrant neighborhoods about their observations. So this is from Yusuf Bey, who's an administrator at one of the neighborhood schools in one of these um, poor migrant neighborhoods in the old part of the city. Here they look at us like stepchildren. They, the local wing of the national government, the Vali, doesn't know us or enter here. The national education officers do not come here. There are only two state organizations, the school and health clinic. The state does not enter here. They do not want to enter because here is the city's other face. The city, the city government, also does not bring good services here, and this is the pro-Kurdish government. I always thought that they were well-intentioned, but I finally came to the conclusion that they neglect this neighborhood and are not well-intentioned. And in the course of our interviews with women, because we were really um, focused on women's development, so we interviewed quite a few women participants, um, in our interviews with women, so mothers and wives and grandmothers and daughters, um, they would tell us about, um, for example, calling if there was some sort of activity to be concerned about in the neighborhood, like drugs, calling, they would tell us about calling the police and the police saying, no, we, we don't go to that neighborhood, we're not gonna come. And so, in addition to these lack of services, there was a lack of security as well. We heard particular concern regarding young people, as seen in this quote from Munise Hanum, an administrator at one of the women's education centers in, this, in the same neighborhood. Young women are being influenced by television and magazines, things that were not in the village, the images of sexuality and material goods. They are going to Ofis and Dakapa, and they want to own the life they see there, the clothing and makeup. But they don't feel the city is theirs, nor do they feel they are part of the village either. There are psychological problems because of this split life. This leads to bad things, prostitution, drug use, crime, political activity. There were a number of narratives that we heard discussing the split life of youth. Youth who had either been born in the village and moved to the city at a very young age, or who were born in the city and growing up at the crossroads of two different kinds of lives and expectations, so that of their more conservative rural parents, and the other of a material culture in the commercial and wealthier districts. And these are children, it's important to remember, who had no memories of the past conflict, and so thus have no understanding of the reasons why they are growing up in these ghettos. Um, why others have more than they have. And then finally, this quote from Elif Hanum. There are no social spaces here. Youth can't express themselves. Nobody takes care of them. And they are always looked down upon, these youth who feel useless. They don't have any other solution except to go to the mountains. Join the PKK. So, dalar giriurum, I'm going to the mountains, and that means I'm, I'm joining the PKK. Where, um, and the PKK has bases in the Kondal mountain range, just south of um, the Turkish border in northern Iraq. Because they are valued by the PKK, government doesn't invest in youth here. So moving back to the built landscape then, back to these neighborhoods, images of these neighborhoods. These are some of the images of the political graffiti that's not uncommon to see in a number of these neighborhoods. Um, so these are images that I took. So um, up here you see PKK, um, Oppo. So it's quite common to see references to the PKK, references to Oppo, and that's the term for Abdullah Ocalan, the founder of the PKK. Um, so this was not uncommon, but over the course of 10 years working in these neighborhoods, we started to see not only the graffiti and the references grow, um, but also diversify. And so, for example, this photo was taken in 2013. Um, and this right here says the YDGH. 
And that's a reference to this youth movement I mentioned a little earlier um, that began in 2013, declaring some neighborhoods autonomous, um, and that really uh, sort of intensified over the summer. So that's a reference to that youth wing of the PKK. In addition to seeing these references um, sorry, in the neighborhoods on the, on the walls, we also started to hear more and more over the last few years um, stories about young people going to coffee shops um, in these neighborhoods to talk to, to get PKK literature, and these were kind of being used as recruiting spaces. And then we heard um, stories from, for example, I remember a story from one, um, actually this last summer, from a woman who told me that she found some PKK literature in her daughter's bed. And she had no idea that her daughter was going and visiting these coffee shops. And so um, it's, it's, that was one indication that just tells you, too, that there is this older generation who experienced the war previously and has this real, um, does not want to go there again. Um, and so I think they're very fearful of what's happening among young people and this movement, this sort of movement for young people to join the PKK. And that leads us here to this news article from NPR in August. In July, that youth wing of the PKK, the YDGH, I know there's a lot of acronyms, but that was written on the wall there. Um, that youth movement took up arms against the Turkish state and began building barricades and digging trenches and declaring neighborhoods autonomous. Two of the same neighborhoods that I just showed you, in fact. It was a movement that started in 2013 in neighborhoods around the Southeast by young people feeling particularly disaffected, according to local residents, some of the interviews that we had. It intensified this movement in July 2015 in coordination with PKK members who have since moved in this, into the cities to help organize. Turkish security forces responded with heavy military force. And so here are some before and after images of the fighting since July. And this works. Um, so on the left are image pictures that I took again in 2013, I believe. Um, on the right is an image that was taken probably a month and a half ago by a journalist. And this is actually the same street. Um, so if you look back there, you can see this mosque. That's that same mosque. So that is a very historic mosque. There, this is in the old part of the city where a lot of migrants moved in the 1990s, in addition to building um, some of those squatter settlements around, the, around the, that central city. Um, and um, so this is where a lot of the fighting has been going on, in fact. And there's a lot of historical sites in this neighborhood in particular. Um, so it's, really, it's been really sad to see these images. Since July, over 500 people have been killed, and that's a very low estimate, actually, because um, this number was taken from a report by the Human Rights Watch in December. And um, I, I would assume that the number is actually much greater than that. Um, 300,000 to 400,000 people have been displaced in this conflict. And those numbers of displacement are so high because as a strategy to, um, to kind of approach this conflict and approach this youth movement and address it, um, the Turkish government has implemented a bunch of um, curfews in these neighborhoods, which basically means that for 24-7, um, for days on end, hours on end, people can't leave their homes. And so that means they don't have access to food and water, um, electricity has been cut, there's no access to medical services. So rather than stay, a lot of people have left. And that's why those numbers are so high. Um, this neighborhood here, um, the Sur, Sur District in Diyarbakir, is in its, I've lost track of the days, but it's somewhere, uh, 80, 85th day of curfew now, so. And these are some images in Diyarbakir of people leaving their neighborhoods. And it's also important to remember that these are um, primarily some of the, the same families that were displaced during the previous conflict in the 1990s, so this is a second cycle of displacement that's, that's happening right now. 
So after considering some of these accounts, both from the material landscape of the city and the lived voices of residents, it's clear that this current conflict is shaped in part by a combination of uneven urban policy and lack of economic investment, fueled by the legacies of past war and embodied in an increasingly marginalized youth. I want to read to you an excerpt from a New York Times op-ed piece that was published January 26th, January 26th by Abdullah Dimirbash, the former mayor of the district um, where much of the fighting is taking place in Diyarbakir, and actually those images I just showed you are of that same district. He says, President Recep Tayyip Erdogan said recently that military operations in the besieged Kurdish towns would continue until they were cleansed of terrorists. You will be annihilated in these houses, those buildings, those ditches which you have dug, he threatened. But what peace can be built through destruction? Decades of military policies against the Kurds have shown only that violence begets more violence. Many residents of these towns are poor families who were forced to flee the countryside when the conflict between the Kurds and the Turkish state was at its peak in the 1990s. Those who are digging trenches and declaring self-rule in Sur and other cities and towns of southeastern Turkey today are mostly Kurdish youths in their teens and 20s who were born into that earlier era of violence, poverty, and displacement, and grew up in radicalized ghettos. Now, a new generation will grow up with the trauma of killing, destruction, and forced migration. Where will they go? What will become of them? And how will an angrier, uh, how will an angrier generation of Kurds and Turks find common ground? The truth is that my generation may be the last to reach a peaceful settlement through dialogue. Maybe you saw the stories I just told you in Demirbash's Demir words. This conflict is, in my mind, as much about class and disaffection as it is about political identity. This is an important story to tell, I think, because it allows us to connect to this place and this region and this, and this conflict in a very human way. We all know this story, a story of a poor and disenfranchised population who has turned to violence to express dissatisfaction with the lack of governmental care and a growing social and economic gap. But this conflict is complex and multifaceted and shaped by events at all temporal and spatial scales. We know that this conflict is rooted in resentments that extend all the way back to 1923 and the Treaty of Lausanne. You can't understand why young people are building barricades in neighborhoods in Diyarbakir without also understanding that. You can also view this conflict in isolation to what has been happening outside and across Turkey's borders. For example, ISIS has played a huge role in the provocation of ethno-national tensions in Turkey. It serves an advantage for their mission to divide and conquer. In October 2014, an ISIS as ISIS vehicles moved across the desert towards the Kurdish city of Kobani, Syria, Syria let's see, yes, sorry, thank you. Um, as ISIS vehicles moved across the desert towards the Kurdish, Kurdish city of Kobani, Syria, thousands of Kurds in Diyarbakir and throughout Turkey, Europe, and the United States went to the streets to protest Turkish government in action just south of its borders. Many also accused the government of secretly supporting ISIS in its fight against the Kurds. Kobani was subsequently reclaimed by the Syrian Kurdish military, the YPG, in January 2015. In June 2015, leading up to the general elections, a bomb at a pro-Kurdish party rally killed four and injured over 100. The apprehended suspect had ties to ISIS. In July 2015, an ISIS bomb killed 33 young people in Suruç, Turkey, a town just across the border from Kobani, who had gathered at the border to spend two days helping to rebuild Kobani. In October 2015, another ISIS bomb kills 102 at a Turkish Kurdish, Kurdish peace rally in Ankara. It was the most devastating single attack in Turkish history. 
So what I didn't tell you when I showed you this photo um, from the pro-Kurdish rally is that um, two days before the general elections is that this photo was taken moments before that ISIS bomb I just told you about went off. Actually, there were two bombs, and four people that day were killed, um, and over 100 were injured. Um, and so when I say that the window for peace was, shat was closed quite dramatically, things like this give you an indication of, of um, how dramatic that was. With the advancement of ISIS, Kurds, and, um, with the advancement of ISIS, Kurds, and not just in Turkey, have felt unprotected and vulnerable. This has been expressed through internal tensions between Turkey and its Kurdish populations, as well as significant efforts to organize counter-assaults, both by Syrian and Iraqi Kurds, to fight ISIS on their own terms. Syria is an important part of this story. So turning to Syria, Syrian Kurds have mobilized militarily and politically in the power vacuum of the Syrian civil war. Just south of Turkey's border, Syrian Kurds have formed a kind of self-government called Rojava, ruled through a Canton system out of which they facilitate operations against ISIS. And it's important to know, actually, that the PKK um, fights right alongside the YPG, the Syrian military, and both act actually share the same political philosophies. So here, this is an image taken from Aleppo in 2014, um, of some children waving the Kurdish colors here, but also waving a flag with an image of Abdullah Ocalan, who is the founder of the PKK. As I mentioned before, he's now in prison, but um, he is still revered as the great, a great Kurdish leader, and you know, he's the leader of the, yeah, the PKK. So, Turkey, long fearing Kurdish separatism internally, obviously as consternation over the organization of a formidable Syrian Kurdish military response, backed by Kurds from across the region. This is one reason the Turkish government has responded to events in southeast Turkey with such force and begun attacks against Syrian Kurds across the border this month. Many suggest Turkey's biggest enemy is the Kurds, not ISIS. And this brings us back to that initial question. Who are our allies? Turkey and the Kurds are both allies, but growing tensions between the two, provoked by ISIS, will further complicate an already quite paradoxical US stance towards its Kurdish and Turkish friends. As long as our allies are fighting, prospects for broader stability in the Middle East are dim, and along with that, prospects for a more self-determined and empowered Kurdish population, whether that's through greater rights and liberties within the states they reside, or for new forms of territorial autonomy. So why does Diyarbakir matter? Why does the neighborhood matter? Because what happens in this region is the result of events at different scales and different dimensions. Securing the Middle East means attending to both the neighborhood and regional geopolitics, as they are absolutely interconnected. The PKK-Turkish state conflict derails efforts to fight ISIS, and so it is important to understand this conflict in its social, economic, and political depths. If the Kurdish question in Turkey continues to be addressed as a problem only of terror and not of one of economic disadvantage and political disenfranchisement, among other concerns, Turkish-Kurdish peace will remain an unattainable objective. Violence, as Demir Bash argued, will only deepen the economic divides already in place, both within the city and regionally, and it will foment resentment for years to come among a young population now experiencing war for the first time. So while I can't provide you with a resolution to the Kurdish question or broader conflict in the Middle East, um, clearly it's quite complex, the answer does not just lie in military action against faceless terrorists, but in decision-making that acknowledges the unique political, economic, and social conditions from which violence arises. Thank you. Thank you. Um, before we get to questions, I just want to give um, a quick pitch because I think one of the things we found is just how terrific geography um, as a discipline can be to illuminating um, wonderful um, and complex issues. And we have um, a geography student who has been um, for this week 
and last week, um, trying to um, make a difference in her own way. Uh, April Sheary of GRCC, and actually um, a student of Dr. Mike DeVivo, um, is working to um, spread awareness for CAMFED, uh, which is um, an organization that helps to educate um, young women in Africa. And so she, um, after the event, will be selling t-shirts. Um, they're really cool, you should check them out. Um, and it's, a, again, another great way to see how these global issues um, can be addressed in some ways. So, uh, check it out. Uh, also, get your questions ready. Um, as uh, Mark has put on the board, um, you can text questions to 616-308 or come on down. Uh, I'll start with um, a question to get the ball rolling. Um, one of the things that I that I was really struck with is just um, this conversation between the specifics of um, Kurdish youth and how they're responding to their environment, but yet how generalizable that is. You know, mm -hmm. when we talk about the question of radicalization mm -hmm. um, and are there parallels to ways in which other people are radicalized. So um, I'm curious, um, you mentioned economic justice, um, cultural justice. Can you think of other ways that um, beyond violence people respond to this um, growing radicalization of the population? Oh. Beyond, um, I mean, I, I think it's really education and acknowledgement of some of these core roots of, of violence. Um, because I think especially something that disturbs me about a lot of the media coverage of the Middle East is that it does kind of essentialize these conflicts. And, you know, even the term like, even a term like terror, terror terrorism makes completely faceless um, any kind of um, the conflicts and any kind of nuance going on and and actually kind of disconnects us from from that story whereas if we can look at kind of what's been happening on the ground in these neighborhoods um, around poor and disaffected youth we can also look easily in our own neighborhoods in our own cities and um, see some of those same processes actually so um, I think it's just it's important to think about the way we're covering events and talking about events and trying to find that human and empathic connection. And I would say um, awareness and education for sure. Dr. Clark, is this working? Great. First of all, thank you for coming uh, mm. to our college and giving a great speech. Um, I'd just like to make a comment about the presentation that you had. At the beginning of your presentation, you mentioned about the uh, Kurdistan area at the first war. Actually, there was never a country called Kurdistan. And you made a comment how Kurds were treated as a second um, class citizen. I think the audience needs to know the fact that when Turkey was fighting against the occupier, Britain, uh, France, Italians, Greeks, Russians, and all that, Kurds well. sided with the British and fighted against the Turks. And during the war of survival, having their own citizens fighting against you doesn't leave a great taste. I also would like you to know that I was in the Turkish military, mm -hmm. serving as an officer. Mm -hmm. November 17, 1984, tells you how old I am. Mm -hmm. That in Diyarbakir, I started my day with having eight 10-year-old kids have a bullet in their head by the PKK. Mm -hmm. And during my service, we continuously fought with this. 44,000 people died yeah. as a result of 1984. Mm -hmm. So I think it is important to know that the Turkish people has yeah. an enormous distrust to the Kurds, mm -hmm. knowing that whenever there's a conflict, mm -hmm. they join the enemy mm -hmm. and backstab and shoot the Turkish and that's people. Not some, some Kurds. Not Absolutely, my father-in-law okay. is a Kurdish person, so yeah. I love him dearly. Yeah. 
Um, so I think it's important, my, my question is, yeah. and I don't want to have my own lecture here, but my question is, if there is a conflict, and there is going to be, where would U.S. stand? Oh, that's a good question. Because the Kurds now are making clear intentions to carve the southeast side that you perfectly mm -hmm. showed the area. Right. To join with the Iraq and the Syrian Kurds. Mm -hmm. Where would the U.S. stand? Well, um, so, many to, so many things to respond to there. Um, I think the U.S. will probably um, continue its policy of, um, I think, making a priority its relationship with Turkey. Um, it's been hesitant to support the Syrian autonomy, autonomous movement. Um, it still has a policy that um, Iraq must be in handling relationships with Iraq that must go through the Iraqi central government. Um, so I would only assume that those policies would remain consistent in terms in regards to its relationship with Turkey and what's going on internally with its conflict with the um, PKK, I would, I would assume. Um, one thing I did want to comment on in, um, regarding one of, um, one of your comments was um, that I, you know, I, I try to be very careful when I'm talking about this conflict by saying the PKK versus the Turkish state or the PKK, Turkish state, Turkish <laughs> government conflict because it's really important to remember that this is not a conflict of Turk against Kurd. This is not Kurd, Turk versus Kurd. There are, um, there is a history that certainly creates some tensions among Kurdish and Turkish populations, but this is a military, um, you know, fighting another military. And it's important to remember that. And actually, it's also really important to, rem to know, too, that the good majority of Kurds in that region do not support the PKK. Um, and look at what's going on are, um, with fear because they are exhausted um, from conflict. And so this is a really fearful time for a lot of people in that region, for Turks and Kurds. And Turks are exhausted by this conflict too, um, in mass, you know? And so um, it's a few kind of segments of the population that are fighting and um, fueling this fight. And I think that's a really important point to bring up, so I appreciate you. I appreciate your comments. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. One of the slides that you had had a few quotes on it. Yeah. And in one of those quotes, it said bad things, and it listed prostitution, crime, drugs, those make sense. But the last part of that was political activity. Yeah. Could you elaborate on that? Yeah, so um, that referred actually to, um, in one of the centers that I was working in, uh, it was actually a center um, sponsored by the local wing of the national government, the AKP. Um, but the administrators are all Kurdish. Most people in this city are Kurdish. It's a very, I probably only met two Turks while I was working down there. Um, but in, um, this was from an interview that I did with um, one of these administrators, and he was specifically referring to stone throwing. And so quite similar to what you see in um, Palestine, a lot of youth um, in southeast Turkey um, who you know, feel inclined to participate in political protests will go and they'll throw stones or they'll throw stones at you know, the police or the military or soldiers. And so the stone itself has become quite symbolic, again, similar to what we see in Palestine. And so in that particular conversation, um, this person was telling me, you know, um, we have, if, you know, if we don't address some of these educational issues and development issues and economic issues, um, you know, children are going to go off and do, um, throw stones. That was specifically what this person was talking about. Engage in political activity that's detrimental to them, their futures, and the future of their families. So that was actually, yeah, so good question. Thank you. First. Welcome to West Michigan. Thank I you. I want to point out that Michigan uh, does have its own issues as to Flint and Detroit. And we I've all live reading. in our own conflicts of life and Yes, we do, don't we? Yeah. <laughs> and uh, the, the questions I have, uh, first of all, is to throw in stones better than shooting an AK-47. And the second is as to conflict within nations 
the United States is not separate. We still fight our own North-South battles, as you can tell from an accent living in Michigan. Mm. My real question to you is, where is Putin in this conflict? And what about the Kurdish destruction of historical uh, artifacts landscapes, et cetera, into their conflict uh, with ISIS. Thank you. The Kurdish destruction yes. of historical sites in Syria? Yes. OK. Yes. Um, all right, let me go back. OK, so Russia. <laughs> uh, yeah, good, that's a big question there. Um, I guess we'll see. You know, um, Russia adds a whole other complicated layer to this conflict um, It's in its support of the As Assad regime. And much to the chagrin of Turkey, as you've probably read. And, you know, um, I think Russia has also been um, an actor that has provoked Turkish Kurdish tensions um, in its support of, um, also in its support of the Kurds in fighting ISIS. And so I think it is another point of, as I said before, provocation like ISIS is too, for this internal conflict that Turkey has with its Kurds right now. And the second question, what was your second question? The Kurdish uh, bombing of uh, yeah. historical you know the, um, uh, buildings, the Syrian, et cetera. Yeah, the Syrian Kurds have, you know, we often were, were kind of fed these images very romanticized images of the YPG, which is the Syrian military, Syrian Kurdish military. Um, so you know, any, any images of the female Peshmerga you've seen are probably images of the YPG fighters. Um, and so, you know, and we have a, the U.S. has kind of this historical friendship with the Kurds and alliance with the Kurds, and the Kurds have done a lot of work for the United States, but. Um, the Syrian Kurds aren't free of fault as well, and so I think there have been um, some accusations. I can't speak specifically to the destruction of historical sites, but I do know there have been accusations of um, forced displacement of Arab populations from some of the um, cities and towns in the now Kurdish self, in the now self-declared kind of Rojava, the Kurdish Syrian Kurdish region. So it's important to look at all of these developments but with a very critical eye. Thank you. Uh, we have some questions from the audience, so I'm just going to um, bring up one. Um, the economic value of southeastern um, Turkey, or, or where there's Kurdish concentration, um, what does that have um, that area have for um, Turkey as a nation state? In other words, why why invest in that area? Uh, um. Well, it's the headwaters. It holds the headwaters of the Tigris and Euphrates River. So it, just in terms of natural resources, it's a very important region for Turkey. Um, and so it serves the Turkish government. It serves the Turkish state um, a lot to an advantage to start developing that region in terms of um, agriculture, modernizing agriculture, creating a standardized system of irrigation, and that's been the motivations to dam both the Tigris and the Euphrates rivers. Um, and that's also been, I said again, as I said again, paired with some of these social development initiatives. And I think the focus of these programs after coming out of that conflict in the 1990s was to really try to address security concerns um, with social and economic integration. And, and gender was very much a part of that, too. And so that's what I specifically looked at, the role of women in that process. But um, it's absolutely a very important region in a number of ways. And um, if you're just looking at sort of economic potential, that's because um, there's two major water resources right there. Hi. Hi. Um, I have, a, I have a couple questions for you. First, thanks for coming out. This has been a really great talk. Yeah. Um, so first, I was wondering where the, because the, there's such confusion in the states over unemployment numbers, and I was wondering how Turks come up with unemployment numbers. Because like we, because like we have so many people dropping out of the workforce and all the other stuff. And I was wondering also if there have been any uh, efforts to kind of spur entrepreneurship 
among the Kurds, like kind of owning your own businesses and kind of taking control of your own economic destiny. Yeah. Uh, and then my, I know I have a lot of questions, but my, uh, my last question would be is that the way that the Turkish government is set up, like insulting Turkishness itself is a crime. Uh -huh. And depending on the mood of the Turkish government at the time, insulting, like that can be used as kind of a cudgel to kind of beat people down or to silence uh, dissonant voices, things like mm -hmm. that. And do you think that those mechanisms like that in the government would need to change before there could be peace between Turks and Kurds? Or is that more of we can kind of wash that over and just make the peace process happen? I don't know if that's a confusing question, but anyway, yeah. thank you. Um, hopefully I can answer all of these um, provoking, okay, um, conflict. So some of these statistics I shared with you about unemployment numbers, you're absolutely right to bring up this question about do we actually have consistent and real accurate data out of this region, and no, we don't. Um, a good, we don't, we don't have a great way uh, to count people and get this information, and that's because, you know, um, first of all, when a lot of these um, populations, families were in the rural areas, it wasn't um, documentation wasn't always consistent, so um, there wasn't a good way to get a head count of people, let alone kind of conduct any kind of census information and that sort of thing. Um, or any kind of census, but um, and that that problem has um, uh, carried on into the urban space. And um, part of the so, if you look at some of these migrant neighborhoods I, I worked in, um, part of the efforts of these development centers, these women's education centers, was actually to go around and document families, how many children you have, where are you working, um, how much money do you make. So that was actually a huge part of the development process itself was documentation. So actually understanding who you're governing, right? Um, and so um, in terms of those numbers, I, this was something I drew from my, um, I can't remember where I got those sources. It was a while ago. And I can go back and look um, specifically and talk to you more afterwards But for those unemployment numbers. But I will tell you, they're um, probably not accurate as our most you know, sort of economic statistics out of this region. Um, let's see, local efforts towards kind of entrepreneurialism. Yes, um, actually prior to this conflict, D. Arbaker was doing pretty well, um, in, especially in terms of tourism. So a lot of, there have been a lot of um, local businesses opening up um, and hotels doing very well, um, locally owned hotels to cater to an increase in tourists coming down to Southeast Turkey. And this is one of the saddest, I, well, it's a number of, or one of a number of sad stories right now about what's going on here is just the, um, impact it's had on the local economy, this conflict. Nobody wants to go to D. Arbaker to visit now. And in fact, where a lot of the fighting is happening is where the historic center is, all the sites that tourists would normally go visit, um, a lot of restaurants that tourists would frequent and hotels they would stay in. Um, but yeah, a lot of these are locally owned. And a lot of the, um, the pro-Kurdish government has been really um, crucial in empowering local populations to be involved in um, kind of taking care of the city, um, participating in the city. And so since they've come into office in the 19, in 19, in, since 1999, when they came into office, this pro-Kurdish party, um, you've seen the, just the infrastructure and the landscape of the city change and develop quite, um, quite well. So there's a n number of public parks now, um, and you know people have been involved in caring for these public parks, constructing these public parks. Um, they're named with Kurdish names. So it's, it has felt very much like a multicultural city, whereas before it would have felt like a Turkish city. And now you actually see Kurdishness in the landscape. So it's really, that's cool. So I would say, yeah, the local community has been very involved in the growth of this city. And then um, insulting the state, yeah. Um, yeah, that's actually absolutely been um, a huge factor in this increased, or not increased, but sustained tensions between Turkish and Kurdish populations. And uh, so I told you, I showed you that image of the billboards from 2009, and shared with you this just sort of sense of day-to-day -day insecurity that a lot of Kurds have. 
never knowing if they're going to say something or do something that will send them to jail. Um, because at any moment, the state can invoke that, you know, you've, um, you've violated this law um, um, in which um, you've insulted the state, in which you've insulted Turkishness. And so that still ab absolutely continues to be a problem in very day-to-day -day mundane ways. So, yeah, the questions. Hi. Hi. Uh, I have two questions for you. The first one is, um, we know that the U.S. government is supporting the Kurds in Syria, the YPG group, yeah. uh, the Kurdish group. Um, while this is happening, the PKK is also attacking Turkey, which is considered as a terrorist organization by yeah. the U.S. and Turkey. Yeah. Um, it's really hard mm -hmm. when the U.S. sends um, financial aid or military aid or any kind of support. It tends to go to the PKK uh, sometimes because it's really hard to control mm -hmm. where it goes, the region is. So uh, there are no borders, you mm -hmm. know, it's hard to uh, right. police at borders. So how do you think the U.S. government should control that, um, you know, military assistance to YPG while making sure the PKK doesn't get their hands on those weapons? I don't know that it can control that because those movements are so integrated now. Um, there are a lot of PKK that are fighting side by side the YPG. Um, and I don't often know the boundary, actually, between those two movements. As I said before, they both draw on the same political philosophies, right. democratic confederalism, some of the writings of Abdullah Ocalan. And I don't know if you can yeah, make that distinction, and it makes it very difficult. I think it highlights the paradox of the U.S., of U.S. policy towards this region. Um, for example, I was thinking, you know, Joe Biden went to visit Turkey about a month and a half ago, perhaps, and he met with um, Prime Minister Ahmet Davutoglu, and he expressed his support for the Turkish state and their fight against terrorism and terrorists, the PKK. Um, but it's really interesting that simultaneously, you know, they're providing arms to the Syrian YPG, which is actually fighting side by side the PKK in many cases. So it's kind of a big old cluster, and I don't, <laughs> I don't know. It's yeah. a hard question, I know. Yeah, mm -hmm. but it just, it, certainly what's happening in Syria and then also this escalation and conflict in Turkey definitely highlights this very contradictory policy the U.S. has towards this region, right. towards the Kurds. Right. Yeah. Uh, my second question is, that you mentioned everything was going perfect, you know, while this pro-Kurdish party got power, 13%, yeah. get, they got 13% 13, 13 of the votes, and then all of a sudden, uh, mysteriously, things changed, uh, and the AKP, the ruling party, all of a sudden, yeah. they lost their majority, yeah. and something happened, no one knows exactly what happened, but um, somebody provoked this, um, you, know, um, uh, you know, old uh, conflict, and all of a sudden, we started hearing bombings and killings, and uh, now the, the, the Turkish population, the Turkish people started showing their hatred towards Turks, and the na Turkish nationalists uh, gained those votes that actually went to the K Kurdish people, um, the Kurdish party. So do you think any, uh, there is any chance that uh, the ruling party intentionally provoked these attacks sort of to create an environment where the Kurdish uh, yeah parties started losing their votes? Yeah. Was it a plot or, I don't know, anything? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, that has been the accusation, yes. Mm -hmm. um, so after that first election in June, um, in that interim period right before, when, well, in that period of time when a coalition government was supposed to be formed, yes, there have been suggestions that the AKP intentionally provoked um, conflict with its Kurdish populations to create fears again around war and terrorism and separatism and fears unfortunately does get votes I think we know that here right. and um, so yes that has been that has been suggested yeah um, I will say it's interesting to note that in the second election a number of Kurds who had voted for HDP actually voted for the AKP the second time around because they wanted peace. And so that's, that to me, that, that shows me how much people in that region want peace. Um, they were willing to say, okay, the AKP can remain 
It's a, it's a single party power. And maybe, and if that happens, then maybe we'll have peace here. So. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah. Just a personal note that Saladin Demirtas, the leader of HDP, um, could have distanced himself from PKK, PKK yes. to gain votes. I almost got tempted to vote for that party. Honestly, yeah, because, a lot of people did. Yeah, I'm usually for CHP, uh, the party that uh, yeah. left his party, but I saw like a huge potential there. He was, you know, embracing the whole country, not just, you know, talking right. about the Kurdish uh, na nationalism. So he was, he was he awesome. But at one point, he, he just didn't distance, distance himself from PKK. Yeah. He, he should have done it, I think. There were, things yeah. would be much different. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, it was an interesting, I'll just note this, it was an interesting um, campaign strategy that the HD HDP used leading up to the first general elections and that they expanded their platform to actually just target um, minorities more broadly um, and address the issue of minority rights among a number of different groups of people. So they enfolded the LGBT cause into their party. Uh, so it was very interesting and it was actually quite effective that first to go around. So a lot of um, people who perhaps wouldn't normally have voted for a Kurdish party voted for the HDP that time. I feel like we've just begun to scratch the surface, <laughs> but we're out of time, unfortunately. Um, so let's... Give Dr. Thank Clark a much. round of applause. <laughs>